All right, we've got uh, our next speaker coming up here for our next session. Just a reminder, after this, we will have lunch. It's on the second floor at the Regency Ballroom. So if you use the escalators, kind of winds you up and around, you'll find signage to the Regency Ballroom. Um, this sec next session is Leveraging the Power of Data and Smart Thinking. Our presenter is Monique Dozier. She's Assistant Vice President uh, Advancement Information Systems and Donor Strategy at Michigan State University. She successfully uses analytic strategies to grow sustainable philanthropic bases and engagement programs. Please welcome Monique. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, first thank Aleutian, who asked me to speak today on their amazing tool, Advancement Performance, which I am eager to share with you our story. Um, so you'll know, I have several of my folks here in the room and I'd like to uh, introduce them and ask them to stand and raise their hand. Jennifer Barrymore, she's my Director of Prospect Development. She's responsible for a three-legged team, moves management, traditional research, and prospect identification. With her, she has her Associate Director for Moves Management, Patty uh, Gonzalez, and Anna Lagunski, her Associate Director for Prospect Identification. And then I have here with me Alicia Crandall, please stand. She is my Director of Business Analytics, Data and Training Services. And with her, she has one of her data scientists, Martin. Please stand so everybody can see you. So we brought a bunch of us out here because we're really excited about what we are doing at Michigan State University in advancement. And we, we are uh, looking forward to sharing our story with you. Just so that you know what I plan to discuss today, um, I'm gonna talk to you about why we strategically decided to buy Illusions Advanced Performance product. Um, and how we are leveraging IBM Cognos and SPSS at University Advancement at Michigan State. Um, I wanna share with you some of the immediate impacts of what these tools are bringing in our decision-making process and allowing us to be able to serve as partners to our frontline and engagement officers. And then if there is time, I'll share with you a specific case study on how we've changed our prospect deployment strategy based upon the information that we are able to now glean from structured and unstructured data. So who are we? In Advancement Michigan State University, we have about 300 professionals. That includes our fundraisers, our alumni association folks, our marketing and communications for advancement, not the university, our researchers, our data scientists, operations, and information technology. We ended our last campaign September 30th of 20, uh, 2007, and it was a $1.4 billion campaign. Our database, we manage a record base of over 1 million entities, which is, includes individuals and organizations, and we are in the silent phase of our next campaign to go public next fiscal year. So why do we do this? When I first took this role a little over three years ago, I had 18 months to deliver on three major strategic imperatives for my team. The first was to re reduce the number of reporting environments that we have from five to one, chart that path, making sure that we had one single source of the truth and that we were updating our reporting data nightly versus weekly as we are doing in some of our reporting environments. So that was very important, because with five reporting environments, we had five different ways that data was coming out, depending on the program that you asked. In addition to that, we also had varying degrees of confidence in that data. The business rules were not established in one environment, et cetera. So we wanted to bring ourselves down to a consolidated way of reporting that was also end user capable. We were, I was also charged with building our first business analytics program at Michigan State in advancement. We are, this team is a standalone team, reports directly to me. It is not a part of IT or prospect development, but Alicia reports directly to me with her data scientists, and we are, she's responsible for all advancement analytics. We also have data scientists in our prospect development team as well that works very closely with Alicia's team, but they do not, they are, they are a freestanding team that reports directly to me. 
The other desire that we had was to become a more data-centric prospect development program. What that meant was prior to um, this change, we had a, a team with a director and five researchers that did traditional research, wealth capacity, utilized all the latest and greatest tools, but what we wanted to do was transform all that data that we were providing to our frontline fundraisers into information that would inform their to-dos, their next steps, their day-to-day -day outcomes. And so what we wanted to do was not just and flood them with a whole bunch of information that they had to synthesize. We wanted to be able to flood them with things that we had synthesized that will allow them to drive their, their imperatives, whether it be fundraising, whether it be volunteer boardism, et cetera. So what we opted to do was evaluate a couple of things. We could have looked at building, and for many of you who understand the landscape of IT, we would not be where we are today if we decided to build. It's changing being able to manage just the, the whole architecture and deliverables and infrastructure would have took us probably a good over a year to even evaluate. Um, so what we decided to do was look into a buy option and being able to look at what kind of tools that we could buy, that we could leverage at our disposal that are industry best practice tools that are out there that have a market share, that are agile in their methodology, that the time to deploy would be less than a year um, we also want to look at, in terms of ROI, time to adopt. We and I want to spend all of our resource and time in evaluating what we were going to deploy, but rather how do we bring our users up to speed and ready for that deployment? What communication strategy we need to have in place? How do we engage them in the deliverable of the, of the tools so that they were uh, not tool phobic, but tool embracing? We also wanted to look at how these tools integrated with our, not just our university advancement IT infrastructure, but we also wanted to look at how these tools integrate with the university's IT structure because we are pushing and pulling data across the campus all the time. One of the things we also need to consider was it wasn't just an investment in tools and not just having the money for these best practice tools, but what did I need to do to get my staff up to speed? What kind of investment did I need to make in them? One of the leveraging opportunities that we had at that time was is that IBM, uh, at Michigan State University's enterprise had already adopted IBM Cognos as a reporting environment for the campus. And they were rolling that out with some of our major uh, large enterprise systems on campus as well. One of the beautiful things for us was that this, at the time that the university was employing the IBM Cognos solution, Illusion had also rolled out advanced performance, which is an IBM Cognos solution as well that allowed us to be able, that married quite nicely with our advanced database and allowed us to bring ourselves up to speed quite quickly by purchasing this tool and working with Aleutian and the ability to be able to roll it out to our users. One of the things that we knew about the tool up front was that it was not an all-encompassing tool. It was, not, it was not ready for full reporting, but it, it, it allowed us to have the right architecture, the right enterprise data warehouse, uh, structure for us to be able to now expand its capabilities and enhance what we could do with the tool, which we are currently doing right now. We also have some leveraging opportunities because through working with Aleutian, we were also able to become best practice partners with IBM and some of their partners as well in terms of what we are doing with the IBM Cognos and SPSS suite. And our approach is really, really that in terms of us and the desire is we, we're always about time is money, time is money. And so therefore, for us, it's really making sure that our deployments, our deliverables, whether it be tools, whether it be reports, whether it be dashboards, whether it be analytics, whether it be data, is that we are delivering what the consumer needs. Our, our keynote speaker this morning talked about, it's about people. For us, it's about servicing the business. And everything that we do has to be foundation and rooted in, is it going to help my vice president and advancement achieve their strategic objectives? We're trying to raise money, make sure we keep our eye on that prize. We're trying to raise awareness for the university, make sure we keep our eye on that prize. So everything that we do in my shop needs to be focused around how do we help them leverage the success of the organization and able to be able to do effectively what they need to do. 
So what do we have? This is the, this is the part after, and I'm sure my staff would all agree, after all the slogging and the legwork and getting these, all these tools up, we have the capability to now agilely deliver with Cognos the reporting needs of university advancement. We have performance reporting, which is end user reports within our AP solution. And I'll share a couple of dashboards and sample types of reporting that we're doing now with Cognos. Um, we have scorecards. We have um, a, um, the ability to now integrate SPSS with Cognos and use SPSS, I'm sorry, use Cognos as our visualization tool for SPSS to leverage our analytics platform. We have built our predictive models. We are able to bring in structured and unstructured data from a variety of sources. We are able to use not just structured data from our database, but structured data from other databases on campus to mine, do multiple types of analytics, et cetera. So as an example, we first wrote out AP, we have a prospect pipeline management dashboard, and that's what you will see on your screen. What this, I guess I can't really do it from both sides. What this dashboard allows development officers to be able to do is to look at their prospects by where they are in stages, where they are in their continuum, where they are in their proposal pipeline, where they are geographically, and aging on those prospects. This is a, a, a six chart dashboard that also has some reports built off of it that allows them to go in there, pull up their name, pull up their unit and look at where their prospects are and what are their to do's. We also work with the development officer management to look at the measurement uh, reports that they need to be looking at every month that they're being measured on. So there's a set of about seven reports that, are, that come off of this dashboard that, they're, that their direct superiors are looking at and that's how they're being measured. It looks at their KBI, so their discovery visits, where they are with their proposal pipeline, where they are with the agent of their prospects, the last time they made contact with their prospects, how many proposals that they had funded declined. So we worked very closely with the leadership of development and now these development officers are able to go to these reports and see what they're gonna be measured on on a monthly basis. In addition to that, Jennifer and her team work very closely as consultants to those groups that prepare them for their portfolio reviews that they have once a month. I think they're now moving to quarterly, but at one time they were once a month where prior to those portfolio reviews, Jennifer and her team, as she's deployed them, are meeting with those development officers and making sure they're ready for their portfolio reviews with their executive leadership. They're also helping them to look at uh, various data points on those prospects in terms of who are there to go to do's. These are multi-dimensional reports. Oh, this one. Yes, sorry, I'll go to this one. So what they allow them to do is in addition to being able to um, pull a report, each of these reports have embedded dimensions. So they are able to, to go several different di uh, places within these reports to other reports that allow them more in-depth information. So if you wanna look at a prospect biographical information, there's a report out there and then there's probably a hyperlink on that report that says and what are the active proposals on that prospect right now that they can go to a new report that talks about proposal detail. If you wanna look at their giving patterns and you can go to a giving report, which is another dimension off the report. So we've made them multi-dimensional as opposed to having to have several different reports that they have to click on. The story is being told through the dimensions of the report. You'll also see, which is a prompting function, that also these reports allow you to, they're standalone as well. So you do not have to just go to the report. You can go to query prompts that we've embedded into these reports that allow them to pull different levels of data on different people. So you can look at your prospects. You can look at prospects rated at the highest level or the lowest level. You can look at prospects geographically. We also have given them some prompt selections to allow them to be able to pull and vary and raise their prospect pipeline. And not just their own, because these are open. As long as you have access to AP, you're in a position to be able to pull anybody's prospects. Management does that all the time as they're looking at the various units that, they, that report up to them. This is an example of our campaign dashboard. As I told you, we are in this midst of going into our next campaign. So what we've done is we built a dashboard here that allows us to look comprehensively at the campaign and where we are to date, updated every night. You can go out there and see. Each unit can go in here and pull up their unit specifically, and the, each one of these charts will refresh themselves, look just at their unit. It allows them to also see various reports, again, off in the left navigation that allows them to look at uh, by gift source, 
by objectives, by priorities, so you can see where you stand. We have working goals we allow you to be able to achieve. We can send you samples of these because it would be very hard to put in a PowerPoint if you want to see some examples of our campaign reports. But we allow them to look every day at where they stand with their campaign priorities, where their donors are coming from, and how their pipeline is doing. We also have built for each one of them a pyramid. So it allows us to comprehensively with the donor pyramid, but it also allows them to look at their unit pyramid. So are you on target with your four to one ratio for prospects based on the nice types of gifts that you need to receive based upon what your, your goals are for your campaign? This was also done in consultation with um, the heads of development but allowing them some real-time way to be able to go out there every day and see where they stand with their numbers. We do officially release numbers every month, and we do make sure that they're aware of that, and we bank those numbers. We also use those numbers to, for freezing tables that allow us to be able to look at how our, our change, our delta changes every month and every year. Um, we release those reports the fifth business day of every month, and they're aware of that, but this allows them to keep current on what they're doing, just knowing that we will officially release campaign numbers every, every month. As I said, we are also now, because we've, we're building out, and we're using all of the Cognos Studios, as you know. We're using Query Studio, Report Studio, Cognos Workbench, Cognos Insights. We are embarking on Metric Studio. We've used Analytics Studio. And now we have taken our, our levels, our, ourselves to the next level, and we're integrating SPSS with, Cogn with, with Cognos. And again, that still allows us to be able to use Cognos as the visualization engine for SPSS. And we do have both versions of SPSS. We have statistics and SPSS uh, Premium. The premium version allows you to do text analytics, entity analytics, predictive modeling, et cetera. So we are looking at, we, we've moved ourselves beyond structured data, and we are now and adding the unstructured data into our platform. So contact reports, freeform text, RSS feeds, Facebook pages, we're now trying to build that intelligence out. Now we know what we know about our consumer base. We're looking at what others, um, what, the, what the consumer base is telling us about us. Athletics is a, is a juicy one to mine because after a game where the win or lose, guarantee that you're gonna get a lot in their SSS, RSS feeds, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so we are, we're looking at that data and then we're reverse engineering that back into our database to see does that influence behavior. So why are we doing all this? Part of it is, is that we know that traditional methods of research, although they still apply 110%, there are a lot more creative ways to hide wealth these days. And for the most of the, so most of the sophisticated philanthropists, we will only get, if I would pick 65, 70% of, of the true picture of their wealth. And so why, we're doing all this so that we can find other ways in which we're able to find the best and the brightest prospects for MSU. As you can see in this chart that I have illustrated here, we had um, did a wealth screening, found some new prospects just like everyone else. Then we kind of looked at those, the, the new prospects against the known prospects and against our alumni association members and against those who are just traditional annual fund members. And what this chart tells us that our efforts are completely overlapping. We have donors who are members, we have donors who are prospects, we have prospects who are donors who are members, et cetera. So our efforts are overlapping. So how do we make these efforts complement each other as opposed to be in competition with one another? How do we make sure that we are meeting our consumers where they, where they first of all, where they want to be met, but also if not where they want to be met, how do we drive them to where we want them to be? And that's, where, and that's how we see the power of analytics. It's really, really about how do you take the best and the bright it's of your information and your knowledge and use that to engage those in ways you want them to be engaged. So in our world, we try to be very focused on, on that effort. We want to make sure that we are meeting people where they want to be. We want to make sure that we are driving them where we want them to be driven. We want to make sure that in our deployment strategies, we're deploying them in the best and the brightest way to benefit the university. So traditionally, this is how we deploy prospects. Wealth, 
as we define, if you can give $50,000 or more to Michigan State University, you'll get a rating code of a one through six. Where did you get your degree? What are your current given patterns at MSU or not? Do you have current given patterns? And then we would deploy those prospects. That is traditionally how we've always deployed prospects. In our new continual model, we're looking at wealth, degree, and giving information, but we're also adding affinity information. How engaged are you with the institution? What are your opinions about the institution from a variety of sources of unstructured data? And then we deploy. It's just add another dimension, another layer of information for us to be able to make sure that we're putting those prospects in the hands of those who can move that gift conversation along. We also use some of this in ways that it's not just around deploying prospects, but we can also use, because the way we've built some of our strategies, we can use that to deploy members for the Alumni Association or make predictions on members of the Alumni Association, new committees, new boards, what have you. But what we're really trying to do is really understand our consumer base. So how do we do this? One of the ways that we did this by the use of structured data is we built what we call is the, the affinity model. We've used 190 touch points in our advanced database, and it's, it's, some of it's statistical, some of it's just to gauge um, awareness, we, and um, it's a very fluid model. It's, a, it's allowed for growth. It's also allowed for some of the data points to drop off as they become meaningful or not. Um, it's not static, so we update this model every week. Currently, our goal in the future is to update it daily as more touch points are made available. Um, it's adaptable. So right now we've deployed this model on our prospects, but this model can easily be used for other engagement tendencies because it's really about engagement, not about what type of constituency that you are. Um, we've normalized, oh, yes. When we built this model, we said, well, we, yeah, we built the model, yes. We used SQL at the time, it, I mean, because we, we had advisor, we are now moving it into SPSS, and then we've used SQL. We just built it ourselves, yep. We normalized it around the base, and when I get into some of the touch points, I'll give you some examples of those, but it's a really normalized, so it's a rare, people are around the mean. And then we have several subcategories that can stand together, which they do as far as the model itself. And they can stand alone depending on the questions that you're trying to answer. So I'll tell you a little bit about the model. So we have six subcategories with this model. Prospect data, volunteer data, given data, biographical data, events, activities, and alumni engagement data. You can see the number of factors if you look at the first uh, row that we used, and we really determined these factors based upon their statistical richness, or, or do, they, do they create a story? Are they valid? Is there enough data there to support a conclusion? I'll give you some examples. So under biographical information, we looked at distance traveled from an event. I'm sorry, your address information. So if you give us your address, your phone, your mail, your email, you get points for that. If we only have one piece of information, you get points for that. If you, um, if you give it to us versus we find it, you get points for that. When we're looking at event information, we're looking at distance traveled. Did you travel from California to the MSU campus for the game, or did you travel from East Lansing to MSU to the campus for the game? Big difference. We're trying to look at patterns of engagement. When I said normalize earlier, this model is not meant for the, the, the points to go off the scale. So we were looking at, if we look, we we're looking at the law of averages. How many people on average do something? And then therefore, you know, the, the model peaks, which is the mean at the highest, at the average, and you may get a point or two over for going above the average, but you're not gonna, basically the goal here was to ensure that within the model that each one of these subcategories would not get you to your highest point. Yes? How would you define alumni engagement? Alumni engagement is activities, volunteerism. So in our database, we have tables for student activities, um, volunteerism, committees, boards. 
So when we looked at that, we look at are you for boards, for an example, are you a current board member, past board member, were you a president on the board, were you uh, just a regular board member on the board, were you a treasurer, did you hold an office, how long were you there? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, because I wouldn't look at my own model. Volunteer is the boards, and then activities is more student engagement, activities, et cetera. So we look at like if uh, your student activity involved when you were in school, and then we also, for activities, we're looking at for like events and things that you participated in. Yes? Right, because if you're below the mean, you're, you, basically you ma your, your maximum, how do I say this? In theory, maximum points are happening around the mean. Okay, then you're getting points above, but you're not gonna get all your points until you get to the mean, if that makes sense. Yes. You will never get to the maximum mean points is no, what I'm saying. Yeah. Totally additive. Yes, sorry. Yes. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. So this model is built on structured data only. I'm gonna to talk to you about what we did with unstructured data. Okay. Yes. So essentially what you'll see is there's a max score for this model at the end of the day. The highest person got 412 points. The minimum score is zero. Some, they, we have people, a lot of, actually a lot of people who got no points, they've done nothing. Makes sense. And then the mean is 86. And then you can look under each one of these categories, what the mean is for those categories, max points, et cetera. Then from here what we did was we gave each one of these levels um, a level name and a description. Then we tested our theory. So again, all we were doing was taking the various modules in our database, we did organize it in that respect, to be able to say, let's look at the engagement across those modules. Let's create a point scale based upon that engagement. And then let's test that theory against our various constituency groups. And what I'm gonna show you is how we tested it against prospects. This also allows us to feed how we dialogue with our development officers on their prospects and their portfolio. So what we found, which now you'll see owners is my level one. You had to have 290 um, points or higher. 60 individuals in our database fell into that category. And we tested some theories here. Owners, 85% of this population is giving at or above their validated rating. That's 58 out of those 60 people. So what this says is to our development officers and when we're in our dialogue with our development officers is if you get your prospects, we're not saying at what rating, it could be a one, it could be a six, that's our lowest rating. If you get them to become an owner engaged by these various areas, which we can show them the details, you have 85% chance of getting them to do what you want them to do in terms of giving. This held true because this was tested against bona fide donors. The next level, participants. We tell them, again, if you get them to this place or in this, in this level, you have a 46% chance that they will do what you want them to do in terms of giving as well. Interested, 52. The flip is, if you leave them down at the lowest levels of our model, when we deploy, because we do give them the model affinity uh, code as well as description, then you have an unlikely chance they're gonna do what you want them to do. Evidenced by the data. So we need you to either move them up or move them out of your portfolio or let's move them to someone else. This was very helpful when we were optimizing development officer portfolios because we had a lot of development officers who had a lot of curious and aware folks in their portfolios and they were not given. Doesn't mean that they're 
not good prospects for someone else or that we shouldn't redeploy because that's the business that we're in. But if you're not able to engage them in your area and others, then we need to look at other areas that they should be engaged. Does this make sense? This was very helpful. And Jennifer's consultants use this all the time when they're, when they're looking at the development officer's portfolios and helping them gauge their to-dos. So this was the first piece that we were excited about. And again, we're, we're, we, you can do this with, it's really about your data, making sure that it, it's, it's rich enough to tell something. You definitely want it to be able to, to, to not be um, spotty data. We look at the data, if it has an 85% confidence level, then it's, it is, it's, it's usable for us. And there's a reason for that. There are a lot of places that will go lower than 85% confidence, which is fine. We chose that because we were building credibility. So when we were looking at our data, we wanted to have an 85% confidence level that it was rich enough to tell a pattern of, of, of the story. As we, well, now that we've built our credibility, we may take more risk in that area. Go down 65%, never would go any lower than that. So now here's the example of what we're doing with unstructured data. And again, as I told you earlier, we use structured data. Now we're using some unstructured data to add another dimension to our deployment strategy. So this is a very, very simple uh, text link analysis. We dumped all the contact reports in our database, over 500,000 lines of them, into SPSS make some modifications to an opinions library that comes with a text a link analysis feature in SPSS, it's a node. And then we started to, within literally 20 seconds, we started to look at patterns in that data based upon keywords. I used the opinions library because I wanted to look at positive opinions about us and quite frankly, negative opinions about us. What are they telling us? Some of the positive opinions that our constituency had about us was that they love engaging with students. So how, what does that inform? We make sure there's a lot of opportunities in our events that they're not just hearing from our academic folks, but they're also able to engage with students, even if it's just one student telling uh, a story. We're making sure that they have opportunities to engage with students because they want to hear from the students. They want to know what's going on at MSU now. They love our donor societies. That was a bit of a surprise for us because the benefits we, we, we struggle a lot with what are the benefits of donor society. Does it create a harmonious group that you want them to do? But we found that our, our constituency really do like our donor societies and um, benefits or no benefits. That was also the evaluation for us as to whether we were going to keep our donor societies. So that, that, that was a shock for us. They love our events. They love the events that we put on around the country. They love engaging with us at our events. So now making sure that we're looking at the, the return on the investment of our events. Who's coming to our events? How do we create more acquisition opportunities for new folks to come to the events? How do we seize these opportunities to engage folks, particularly in the, in the midst of a campaign where we're about to do a lot of regional events, a lot of local events? How do we make sure that we're now, if, if the folks who are there who love our events are getting those others out? We've created volunteer networks to make sure they get more people out. Just again, we're just hearing from what they're saying to us in the data that was written. Free form text, 300,000 lines, or, free for, or 500,000 lines of free form text, 45 seconds, dumped it in the SPSS and started to look at those patterns. These libraries are, modif are modifiable and they needed to be modified and we're still modifying them because they were the, the product, um, they come, they're more consumer uh, for-profit um, opinions libraries. They really need to be modified for not-for-profit. So some of the things that they think are important and vice versa are not, are not the key words that you want to be looking at. And then there are a lot of others. This, uh, the Opinions Library is one example that I used. We looked at some negative opinions. A lot of folks were telling us that there's a lack of engagement opportunities with our president. Now, one of the things that we talk about as, a, as an executive team in advancement is that we struggle with that a little bit because your president should be for the exclusive group of those who are giving you major dollars, right? So now 
So we want people to give more to get access to our best prize, which is our president, although she doesn't know that because she's always in engaging across campus, but that's on the side. So what we want to do is utilize the Alumni Association to be able to allow where there's opportunities for champions and for people to spend time with the coaches, et cetera. Maybe those are opportunities where we'll, we'll have the president come and speak and rally with the folks. They like to do it. We just need to balance that with our strategies. But they're telling us that they don't have enough time with her, so we need to make it happen. We had a lot of people that were telling us at a given point in time they were out of work. Hence, they were not able to give money to MSU. We use this opportunity to connect them with our career center, both the career center on campus, but also the alumni career center. They're telling us this. How do we, how do we turn this into a positive for us? Gift responsiveness. This is my area. They said that they were not getting their acknowledgments quick enough or their receipts quick enough. Now we have to evaluate or have been evaluating how do we speed up the gift processing process. Now we're listening directly to the consumers. Questions? We both. So we have our treasure trove of all of the prospects that we have deployed in the past three years, which is when we first started this juncture. We are watching them. Patty and Jennifer and company spend a lot of time watching those move migrations. And we have a lot of reports that come out and show us what the moves are, both up positive and negative moves, and also the aging. So how long they've been in. We have, a, we have a, 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 in our continuum, discovery is six months. Cultivation is 18 months, and then you have another six months for solicitation. We are watching people and how long they stay in discovery. Do they go past the aging? Do they go past the aging of cultivation, et cetera? We are watching that. Because we've only been doing this for three years, there's not enough data there to tell us, therefore, it, part of it is just the development officers are getting them focused. So there's not enough, we haven't been doing this long enough to be able to say that the, um, because they've been out in discovery for 12 months, with a whole new slew of people coming on that, that they're not good discovery prospects is where I'm going with that. So we're working through that. But we have a lot of reports that we're looking at um, aging on our prospect pipeline. Well, I, I, and I want, if any of my directors want to come up and, or say anything about this, the hard time is the tools. So to your point, when we built the model, because we had to use SP, I mean, SQL to build the model, we had to, we had to write 8,000 lines of code to get a model that we were satisfied with. Now we have tools we can drop and drag and build nodes. So now all we're doing now is trying to utilize these tools because now we've, we've, we've made the investment in some tools that allow us to move quicker without us having to do everything um, from a, from, as a programmer or a developer. So what I wanted for my, particularly my data scientists, is spend less time with the programming because that is, that is not what I need you focused. I need you focused on the data and what the story is that's being told. That's the, that's the best practice to me. I know my, my, my users, my customers are not going to be able to use it. And once I have that confidence, 
we're able to communicate that process to them as well. Our whole goal here is to make sure they raise money so we can claim it too, right? <laughs> so because of that, we want them to make sure they have the right folks in their portfolio so then we can therefore, we, we, we helped you achieve that. And again, we, we went from a team that three years ago couldn't buy a phone call from a gift officer to a team now that can't keep them off the phone. <laughs> So we have complete buy-in here and trust, which is another important thing. And they love AP. We get calls every day. They want more of AP. We can't, we can't develop quick enough in Cognos and AP to, for their satisfaction, but they love AP because they love being able to go look at their numbers really quickly. They didn't want to have to go through 200 reports and figure out which one do I choose today because it has code name X. <laughs> Just tell me where you want me to go and I will go there. They love AP. Other questions? The Illusion Advanced Performance Cognos tool that we purchased. Yes? Okay. I, um, well, I had a team three years ago of 30 and now it's 65. But they're spread out. So um, I added, on the IT side, I added a probably another 16 positions, including a whole Cognos team. I have a director over my Cognos team, uh, three uh, uh, developers, reports developers, a Cognos EDW arch data modeler, a data architect, and then a framework manager and a Cognos admin. So I created an entire new Cognos team. We, we had a gap there. But most, if you have never worked with Cognos, that's, everybody will have a gap. So what we did was is um, we had a lot of SQL programmers, um, some Oracle, but we also or hired a, a certified Oracle DBA as well. So, and then we've done a lot in terms of staff development. So I remember there was a question in the last session in terms of some of the things I've done. I spent the whole year and a half with a training curriculum through a company called the Ironside Group to train up my staff. They've taken a series of classes in Cognos and SPSS in um, data warehouse and data modeling. We've done some classes through Oracle. We've done some uh, workbench classes, query studio classes. So we, we've put a, a lot of money into staff training, staff development around the toolkit that we, were we are using. Uh, we've done some web app trainings, et cetera. On the prospect development side, there were five, six. Now there, there were four, okay, well, plus a director, that's five. Now there are um, 12 on PD. The analytics team is completely brand new within the past three years, so there are four, five there, and we are in the process of adding another. And then we made some uh, growth in gift processing, which is, is just adding some more processors. So we did, we did, we did uh, look at a lot of staff development over the past, and I would say I, I put a lot of money into that. But the, the, but the, the payoff is, is, is very significant. And we do now have people who are going for certifications. So now it's my job to keep them, which is good. But one of the things you'll find on the market, particularly when it comes to Cognos, these are very expensive people and we are universities. So um, I, did, I had to make a decision to grow my own, and it's paying off. I just need to make sure I can keep them when they leave. <laughs> yes. I can't hear. Right. So, so when you So this is based specifically on the contact reports dump. And it's based specifically on 60% of the base who was in the negative saying that. So there's percentiles embedded behind here that I didn't show. If that makes sense. And then I looked over 10 years. So I'm not trying to look at it being a negative for 200 years ago or whenever the contract report was put in the system because at this point, so I did look at a 10-year range. Keywords, yes. And you can modify those keywords you're looking for. And you can also get the data itself. So it's not like SPSS is just going in here, you put in a keyword and then you're, decide, and you're just saying poof, and SPSS decides that 
this is what we believe. You can actually export the data and see what the data is telling you. And, my, and truthfully, you have to modify your keywords because sometimes what you think was the right keyword is not. <laughs> Definitely. Like I said, one of the reasons, we, what, the way that, as, and again, because it was built for corporate America, sales was one that was, was really throwing me off. So I had to pull that out because it, it was not it was not meant for me. It was meant for a sales, sales force that's um, like a pharmaceutical sales force. One second, and then your one last question, which I felt the answer was, what was the hardest part of doing all this? Um, not buying the tools, but insinuating yourself into an in, in, institutional data. Um, I'm sorry, inf, institutional IT master plan. Where they, we were not the focus. So hence, we hired some firms to come in and help us get off the ground so we would not be an impediment to the university's IT staff, which is where our, our tools sit. If that helps. Yes. So my IT folks are, um, I have an applications programming team. That team is responsible for our database itself, coding logic cleansing, pruning the table, making sure the ETLs are working, et cetera, and smart call, and we have iModules. I have a network computing team, which is desktop hardware support for central advancement. Then I have the Cognos team, which is heavy development on the Cognos side. My analytics team, they do ad hoc reports which we're trying to move them aggressively away from, then they are consumers of the data, but they do no development. They are doing some SQL, but we're moving away from that as they get more into SPSS. Other questions? Yes. Yes, yes. So there's the social media and how we're able to do social media. So in SPSS, there is various nodes that you can use where you can connect to RSS feeds on, and then be able to pull in data. We have the server version of SPSS, which is actually why we bought it, because we, we do this, or we're fishing that up now, but we plan to do this on an iterative basis as opposed to flat files. Um, we are looking at buying, which is called, um, SMA, which is social media analytics through SPSS, which is just, if you, if you know anything about IBM, every year they come out with something new, they give it a different name, they wanna charge you a whole bunch of money. Good stuff, but I'm just telling you that's how it works. So, um, so they have the ability for us to not just, right now all we can do is mine our uh, social media sites, so our Facebook pages, our RSS feed, anything proprietary to MSU, SMA allows you to mine the entire social media space. They can do that in Cognos. We're moving that now. So one of our, one of our last legacy tools that we're, we're taking off is, is just that, where we're moving all list generation to Cognos as well. You can do that in Cognos, yes. We had to get all the reports out of our various environments moved over. Now the next step is to move all of our list generation. Otherwise, we, we have built a homegrown um, Oracle um, query tool that we want to get rid of. One of the things I like about the way that our Cognos infrastructure is that we can embed our business rules in a way that as they change, they're easily to adapt. Yes. So when you mine social, uh, social network, how do you match what is the opinion of your consumer data and data? You can reverse engineer it and use um, some entity analytics to be able to now take um, names and some you know, various. It's not going to be perfect because um, we do have Facebook pages and LinkedIn, and we do keep all that in our database, but if we don't, we have to use some keywords like names, emails, to be able to see if that is the person in our database. So in some respects, so we're doing this two ways. We're trying to find the people, but we're also just trying to find what they're saying, if that makes sense, which doesn't really translate to the people always. So they log into our database, and we're, we're an advanced client, and they log into our database to do lookups and look at their, um, their um, contact information and, and enter their data. 
proposal, et cetera. But AP is really for reporting for them to be able to see where their ROI is and their KPIs, yes. So we're trying, and that's one of the things we had to do too. We have so many tools, we had to distinguish when you do what for what. And so we're making AP 99%, everything that's reporting will be living in AP with the exception of anything that has to be reported on in real time because AP is only updated nightly. So Illusion does provide you some dashboards that you can modify for your use or not. We chose not to because just, and again, they were good samples for us to work from because for, regardless of why we chose to, they would tell you certain things people are looking at in the industry. So they're very good samples. But because of trying to embed our business rules and be able to look at our prospects where we wanted to, it was much easier for us to start from scratch. We were trying to, we spent a lot of time in the beginning, no offense, Nancy, but we spent a lot of time in the beginning trying to figure out why they got one calculation and we got another, and we just said, forget it. <laughs> we're gonna go do, a, do our own, so. But they were very, very good for, to give us some pointers and what people are looking at, what we should be thinking about. They were also very good for us to show the advancement leadership and get their reactions to, um, in terms of, is this the kind of things that you wanna see on a dashboard, et cetera, yep. And again, when we bought the product, we were well aware that it was not an all-in reporting tool, but it was 65% of the way we needed to be. It required no uh, building on our part. So it, it, was, it was absolutely the, one of the greatest investments that we made. Unfortunately, they're not integrated, so there's two web links and they go there, but they are both links off of our internet so they can go click on them or they can bookmark them. And I do know that I'm not sure where that Nancy is here, if you want to talk to her. There was conversations about being able to do that in the future, but they haven't done that yet. Yes. See, I'm only going to take credit to the point of which the ask occurs, because if the development officer isn't making the ask, I can't say I'm getting more gifts. <laughs> but I can tell you is, is that there's a, a much more focus, and we are seeing that in this next, and we had other factors that had giving going down, but we are seeing that they are making better ask on their prospects now, which is good. Um, Patty's the one who, who's sitting, uh, three people down for you who cringes all the time, but she does quarterly reports that shows the activity on our major prospects, one, twos, and threes, and are they making those right asks? And we're seeing a lot of change, a lot of this. We have, in the, you know, just to put it all in context, in the past three years, we've done a lot um, in terms of putting discipline with our gift officers that they, and not just from us giving them new reporting, but metrics and different things like that that's really got them um, a little frazzled, but in good ways, and, and some of that's calming down now, so now they can, Focus more. So, Is that it? okay. One more question, if I have one. Well, thank you, everyone. If you want to know more, if you even want a demo of AP, we, we'd be happy to show you it because those charts really don't represent the amazing tool that we've purchased. Um, just let us know, and we'd be happy to set up even a WebEx when we're back in Michigan. So, thank you.